babe? Yeah. What are we gonna do about Christmas? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, my parents want them to come to their house. My parents want us to go to their house. Can we just not do either one? No, we can't do neither. <laughs> we have to spend Christmas with our families. We have to make a decision. <laughs> well, what are we gonna do? I don't know. <laughs> I'm done with kicking, screaming, pulling your hair open fights. I'm done with running and leaving, trying to prove that I'm right. It ain't right. Let's not go there. Let's find Good morning, everyone. How are we all doing? I'll give you one more chance. How are we all doing? Yeah, come on. I mean, after that last song, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm taking that you're just gathering your breath or something like that. You know, uh, my goodness sakes, uh, I got to sometimes gather my breath. I'm like, uh, my wife will sometimes see me play some worship in my house, and she's like, uh, you're not 16 still. Oh, you know, uh, I'm like, come on. Uh, I would pull out my, uh, she'll recall stories of my uh, leather pleather pants. And yes, I did have pleather pants. I couldn't afford leather ones there back uh, when I was, I don't know, 16, 17 years old. I was, you know, I went to try them on recently and I'm like, hey, I can get them still on. And she said, honey, you're putting one leg into both your legs right now there. So it's actually about half the size. <laughs> oh, that's what happens. Well, when you grow in love, you grow in other things. So anyway, well, again, good morning. My name is Steven Skinner. Welcome, guests here in the palace at Forward Point. Welcome, guests right now jumping on Facebook uh, live, streaming live. Where are you in the city here, in our village, across the state, the globe? Welcome. We are glad you are spending your Sunday, hopefully morning here with us here. And again, a uh, little inch of snow, that's nothing. You know, like, I mean, just, you know, we're... we're that, you know, I, I'm proving that groundhog wrong. You know, groundhog even just got up on the wrong side there. It said winter's going to come on. We're, we're hoping this nice weather is going to stay with us. So anyway, so again, we are thankful you are with us today. We are right now climbing down, I call, the hill of a series. Uh, typically, a lot of our series we do are three and four weeks. This series was a big one. This was a five-week series called Love Song. All right, we have been diving in to Song of Songs, which is written by King Solomon. This would have been David's son, a man in the scriptures referred to as the most wise person that ever lived, uh, inspired by God to write this book that at times when you're reading it, you may feel like, okay, he's a little over the top here. But again, there's a lot of significance here. And we are using this book during this month to talk about our relationships that we're in. Uh, the first week, Jimmy kicked us all off and we talked about faithful attraction. We talked about the foundations of being in a relationship. You know, that godly character is some of the most important things you are looking for in a relationship, a spouse, moving forward, uh, you know, working together, building trust. Uh, I, uh, a few weeks ago, I spoke about the, the seasons, the seasons of a, of a relationship. So right now, again, we had a little taste last night when I was looking out my window of my office late last night. I saw these little flurries coming down. I'm like, oh, we're not quite out of it yet, but we're, we're getting there. We are in the season of winter still. And uh, in that season of winter, you don't see that many leaves. You don't see green grass. You don't see beautiful flowers blooming outside. But uh, spring is coming. So winter is a time to learn, a time to grow, a time to listen so that we are prepared for spring, which is a, you know, a sign and a relationship of things flourishing, things coming about. So that was a few weeks ago. Then Jimmy, we planned it that way. No, Jimmy last week was able to speak about godly intimacy and again, the relationship that God blesses about how, how you can have godly sex within your marriage and how, how two become one and how it's much more than just the physical side of things about how important it is that uh, your, your, love, your love for God and also it's much before anything would take place physically. Your hearts are one. 
So he spent time on that last week. We are today, fourth week here of our series. It's coming down the hill now here. We only got one more week left to do, and this is going to be a good one. This is this, uh, this week is going to be on reconcilable differences. I know it's a big word, and uh, some people would know that word. Uh, myself, I have to like look things up. No, but uh, understanding how do we have compatibility in our relationships. And so hopefully today we're going to learn a little bit. Remember, if you are in a relationship right now, or if you are not in a relationship right now, or maybe you never want to be in one, you will have relationships with someone, I guarantee you, sometime. These principles are universal. Yes, some things apply specifically to marriage here, but most of these things will be universal, the things I will be sharing, the things that I will be teaching today. So we're going to have a little bit of fun here. And uh, again, just so you know, in case somebody, to burst anyone's bubble, that when you're in a relationship, you fight. I think uh, sometimes we think when we you know, have said, oh man, I found the perfect one, or I found a great one, or whatever, that you're never going to have a fight. So to burst your bubble, uh, and anyone who maybe can uh, give me some confirmation, if you are in any type of relationship right now, and you have had some type of fight over the during of the time of your relationship, you can raise your hand. I can barely see anyone here. Okay, whatever. Uh, You can, uh, has anyone had a fight maybe this morning? No, don't raise your hand. No, oh, jeepers. Oh, Manny, don't give it away, brother. You you did so good. No, joking. That's great. (laughs) Manny's like, whatever Stephen says, I'll raise my hand. No, don't do that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no, again, I don't even know if you had any fights today. That's why you're here. That's a good thing. But, uh, yeah, f- couples fight, okay? What uh, we are going to learn today is that it's, it's even healthy couples fight. It, it's just how we fight. So let's go through a few differences right here. So all couples fight, healthy couples, just like we saw that little pre-video there. They were working through it. Healthy couples fight clean, okay? Unhealthy couples fight dirty. Healthy couples fight for resolve. Unhealthy couples fight for their own victory, fight for themselves. They want to win the argument. It's still, again, kind of, uh, you know, shocking to me sometimes that uh, I will hear from sometimes people in our life group, you know, wonderful friends of ours, maybe a little bit younger, and they'll say to uh, Katrina or myself, I mean, you guys are such a great couple, you know, man, I can't imagine you ever fighting. Don't laugh, Jackie. No, uh, (laughs) darn it, she laughed. No, she knows us so well. So it's like, you know, it, you know, we have a, it, we've pulled the wool over some people's eyes if that's the case. They do have, yeah, it, well, exactly. I'll get to that part there. So again, half of that being right, the fact that we do have a great relationship. I do realize more and more every day, God has bestowed a wonderful woman in my life that will put up with so much of my shenanigans. And uh, she is amazing. However, we do fight. We have been in arguments before. We have been in our spats before. And if you've ever heard the term opposites attract, you know, being that uh, Katrina and I, by the grace of God, we work together in so many things we do, um, we would also define in many ways the opposites attract factor. So again, just a couple things here. And I told my wife, I said, hey, she could always, maybe she's listening in here. She's always saying, I'm going to hear what you're going to say about me. So uh, the, she is an introvert. She is a person that would be extremely just content to be, you know, left alone sometimes. Uh, She is a number crunching uh, administrator, bookkeeper, finance accountant. On the other side, she met me, who I am more of an extrovert, and I am a big thinking visionary, all right? And when those two things collide, it gets a little uh, crazy. The, the running joke sometimes uh, she'll, uh, she'll, she'll say with me is that, you know, Stephen, you are really amazing. God has given you an amazing gift to start all these businesses. But the amount of crap that you leave behind that I have to clean up to somehow keep them going is never ending. 
and then my smart mouth says, Alicia got job security. So, uh, and, uh, yeah, so it doesn't go so hot when I say that to her, and that's usually not a good thing, but uh, it wasn't as bad as me calling her a goat this week. I'm like, your hair's like a goat. That's what Jimmy told me to say to you. Um, it, uh, it, uh, that didn't go so hot from last week's uh, message. But uh, nonetheless, uh, we have a great enough relationship where we can have dialogue and be open and be vulnerable and have lots of fun. But... We, uh, we do have two different styles of enjoyment. Her enjoyment, again, she would take a little beach chair, sit along the ocean, crack out a book, just, just take it all in, the sounds, the, uh, whatever novel she's reading to get away. And, uh, or in a park, she loves going to, uh, uh, she might do a park, she might do, uh, you know, go to uh, some type of field and just get away. And you got me, when we go either out of town or whatever, I'm, I'm a village guy, so I'm, I'm like, I'm looking for the village. I'm trying to figure how every single business, I can recruit them somehow to come back to Eastwood. I'm looking at traffic patterns, and I'm like, how could economically they can make this better? That, you know, that guy, if they just did a better job, they would, you know, they're marketing. So, you know, I might have a coffee and donut in my hand, and she's there sipping her whatever uh, Dasani water there and just enjoying herself. But we have two different styles, and yet we come together. We have had probably arguments over every single topic before in our life from how we handle our house, how we handle our children, and our finances, how even we would run our companies. So just about everything. So in case you are thinking that, well, man, it must be just me, that's not the case. The question is not whether you're going to have conflict in your relationship. The question is how do you deal with that conflict? How do you grow from that conflict? How to become compatible and more like Jesus in every way. So we're going to jump in here and we're going to take a little look here at the Song of Songs here and how these two lovers are seeing how they have to work through things. So let's look at Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 2. And she is talking right now. And she says, I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my love, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew. She's hearing him call out. My head is drenched with dew, with my hair, with the dampness of the night. So she sounds like she all is you know, into him. And then he is, you know, he, he is now knocking. He is waiting. He is wanting her. He wants to have interaction. Now, if you look at the last couple of weeks, and the things that we have talked about, about uh, week one, it, it talked about when she was calling for him. She would say, strengthen me with raisins. Now, again, you wouldn't think strengthen me with raisins, but that was like an aphrodisiac. That was something that would really, you know, whatever, arouse and just really get someone, you know, strength. Now, who knows, we may do a Red Bull or something. But anyway, but um, uh, and his left arm is under my hat and his arm embraces me. That was week one, we talked about that. Week two, we talked about until the day breaks in the shadows flee. Turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle and a young stag on the rugged hills. And then week three, I'm just going to say it the way it is. Don't take it in any weird way here. Week three, she says, blow on my garden. Let my beloved uh, come to his garden and taste from its choice fruits. All this affection, all this passion, all this love, she's calling for him. She wants him. And yet we know how sometimes, and I'm not trying to, you know, be all sexist here. Sometimes women can change their thoughts and their ways. So here, he's calling out for her. I'm drenched with dew. My hair is damp of the night. You know, come, my beloved, to me. And then (laughs) her response here. Song of Songs 5.3 here. I've already taken off my robe. Must I put it on again? I've washed my feet. Must I soil them again? In other words, this is translated from Hebrew as I have a headache and I do not want you tonight. No, joking, no. No, this is uh, you know, translated that I'm already in bed. I've already checked out. I'm not getting up and coming to that door and I'm sorry. So no one has ever experienced anything like this before, right? We've never had this thing where we've had conflict before. And again, it could be something different. It could be someone wants love and the other person doesn't want love. Someone wants to talk and chat while the other person just wants to stay quiet. Someone wants to maybe just be left alone. Maybe you've had a fight over what TV to show to watch and what programs. And how do you like to end your evenings and just calm down? 
we've all dealt with, I'm sure, the, the headache one or I'm too tired version as well. So these are things that we've had conflict on. Let me be a little vulnerable here and I'll, I'll share some of our, our funny things that we've had to work through here. And this is all good stuff, even for the kids here. Katrina and I have always had a different uh, way of just how we like, we call it decompress at the end of the day. We have a lot of things going on in our head. And again, we still obviously have to work through things because we still can never get it right quite. But she likes to go to bed reading a book, maybe a lamp on, and she likes the silence besides that. I'm a little strange because I like the lights off or whatever. I like the lights off, so I, I, don't want all, I don't want to be seeing everything. I don't want to see all whatever, if it's work in my uh, our bedroom or anything I set down. I want to have lights off, but I don't mind the TV on because to the TV on to certain programs is like white noise and it just, it just you know, uh, someone like, I just conk right out in a few minutes. So we've had to work through this because the thing is, is that she does not like that stimulus. She does not like it, especially... Don't ask me, but sometimes I watch these mystery shows. I'm not a big person into fiction, so I'm into mystery. And for a while, I was on, on that whole uh, uh, forensic files or whatever, which is really gruesome and terrible there. And I don't know why. She's always like, what are you going to do, murder me? I'm like, I don't know. But anyway, uh, no, I don't want to do that. But, uh, but anyway, I've watched that. Or Mysteries in the Museum. I love those type of shows, you know, just mysteries and all that stuff. But it's, like, it's just like white noise in the background. She cannot stand that. So she's like, come on, TV. And I would be like, come on, you're, you know, if you could read the book with the light off, you can do that, you know? And, uh, but I don't want to see that light. So we have had to work on these things and figure out how do we come together and deal with our conflicts. So let's go through a, th a few things. I've, I've shared enough about all the bad of everything. Let's go uh, through a few things of how do we resolve conflict? Again, this is universal. So again, if you're not in a relationship right now, you may want to be, or maybe you're having a hard time getting along with people at your work. It could be with your children. These are many things that are universal in your relationships you have. Number one, unmet expectations. Number one to resolving and understanding conflict. It's unmet expectations. She thought he was perfect for the first six months. He did everything right. He was so great before we got married. But now I realize he doesn't mow the lawn like my dad did. My dad always made sure every bill was paid on time. He did my oil changes and rotated my tires. On the other hand, he thought she's the only one. She's perfect in every which way. But so many months into the relationship, he realizes dinner's not on the table at 6 p.m. She is cooking TV dinners. Mom made a nice, wonderful, fresh dinner. It was always great. Mom did my laundry. Mom even had my clothes all laid out. These are the age-old questions, discussions, but unmet relationship expectations are so, are so uh, important to understand because we have this unrealistic view about someone else that they need to be like someone else. We struggle at the fact of understanding how to play to someone's strengths versus focusing on their weaknesses. And we'll touch a little more into that. couple little quick stories here. Again, Katrina and I, nothing new. All the stuff I'm sharing with you, it's not we've overcome all this. It's the stuff we're going through and the stuff that we have been through. Uh, Katrina, again, we both have been raised with wonderful parents in our house. Uh, both differently, we are raised, though. She was raised, uh, her father was a teacher and went into the ministry later on. But while she was in the home, he was a teacher. So he had a little more regular Monday through Friday schedule, and he did take the majority of summers off. So with that, they were people who loved to camp. If you know Brad and Sherry, they are camping right now. They've been camping for a few months. They love it. They love camping. Don't ask my mother if she will camp. She will not camp. But, uh, but nonetheless, um, they are campers. She remembers the most amazing trips camping throughout the summer. Here's the problem. 
I was raised in our family Christian bookstore. We had to work Monday through Saturday and we helped out church on Sunday and very few vacations were there. And usually we had to somehow combine a business with a vacation. Camping was not my forte being raised. I'm really no good at it. My idea of a, of a, of a campsite is an Airbnb where everything is done for me. So uh, uh, that's, uh, there you go. Tina agrees with me. Amen. All right. So, so again, we were raised in two different backgrounds. She's used to the whole camping and be by a lake and reading. I was not. So this brought conflict because all of a sudden these expectations early on, first, second, third year of our marriage, of, you know, of thinking about all those wonderful times where I'm going to work through an entire summer when she remembers doing this. And in turn, other things that had happened was that, that, that myself toward her was, I'm used to a mother where you could literally, if you know my mother, you know she makes food on the spot. She can whip up something gourmet dish, two seconds. She has literally, Wegmans is like on speed dial and literally has part of her warehouse in part of her house. And she just goes, she has a grocery car and she goes down her aisles of her own pantry and she can just whip up anything at any time. And it's amazing. It's a little unfair. I was raised with that. Well, again, when you're raising children and you're asking your wife to work, she can't do that. That's not going to be her strength. So we had to work through these hurdles. We had to overcome uh, how we handle our quiet time at the end of the day. Uh, There was the times where we had, uh, I know, this was a major another struggle that we had in our life. And again, God has helped me to work on myself in it. being that I was in a stressful job, even in retail, being in management, working on uh, our bookstore that at the time was a, a, lot of, a lot of tension, a lot of struggle. She was raising our two children at the time at home, and she was stuck most of the time like in an apartment where we called it Motel, Motel 81. It was right near, uh, right near Cracker Barrel there, the old Gander Mountain there, and we called it Motel 81 because it's right off of 81 there. There wasn't a lot of interaction with other friends and family. Our, our, her friends did not have children. They really were not even thinking about children at the time. And she would be cooped up with Ugu Gaga talk all day long. And me, on the other hand, I'm working long, 12-hour shifts. When I come home, she just wants to be able to hear how you're doing, go over your day with me. That's the last thing I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about my day. I want to get away. And what I ended up doing, which was, uh, again, now I've learned from it, but it was a mistake at the time. I bought a video game system. And again, video gamers are all over the place now. Everyone has games. The problem with me being so obsessed, I bought that. And literally, she will tell you, and she's probably shocked I'm even talking about it now, but there was a time of about three to four years of our uh, marriage they even stretch longer even after that, that when I came home, I don't want to know about anything. I just want to go play my game and get away, even to the point she'd be like, aren't you coming to bed tonight? Don't you want to talk? Don't you want to snuggle? And I'm too busy playing NBA Jam. No, anyway, but uh, I was engrossed. Was I deliberately doing this because I didn't care for her? I did not love her? Not at all. I did love her. I needed to decompress. The problem was I was coming from the aspect of myself, not seeing how do I meet her needs. So looking back, God has literally done a work in me. Uh, Again, there's always things to work on, but I think it's been over five years. I'll have to ask my children, but my kids will probably say at least five years, dads has not played a video game, and it's a monumental thing, and I don't even want to. And I know if I probably do, I'll go off the deep end again, so I don't. I just am free of that. I can be into something else. I can focus on things that really matter. That was something that God convicted me on, and I had to deal with because it was hurting my relationship with my wife drastically. So number one, unmet expectations is one of the root causes of conflict. Number two, let's jump right into this here. Self-centeredness, or I would call selfishness. Self-centeredness is one of the other root causes of conflict, of having tension in your relationship. Why did the, in Song of Songs, the woman say, you know, again, 
I have taken off my robe. Must I put it back on again? She was in bed. She did not want to come up. He might have been out working. He might have been out, who knows what he was doing, with his men, putting out orders. He wants time. She doesn't want to come to the door. She wanted to put him off. We all struggle with this because we all, in deep down inside, are, 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 even our souls want to be about ourselves. One person likes to save money. The other person likes to spend money. One person likes to go on lavish vacations. The other person would do a staycation. One person likes to get the best groceries. The other person doesn't mind getting only things on sale. It goes on and on. Uh, to all our wonderful gadget lovers here and phone lovers here, someone does not care about what, what phone they have as long as it works. And the other person has to have the latest device. I will, I will keep people nameless in this room. No, joking, no. Um, so we have to have sometimes the brightest and the best. And that can go with anything. Purses, clothes, vehicles. But we think about ourselves. One of the hardest things in a relationship is seeing things from the other person's perspective. Again, this is universal. Think about the relationship you're in. Think about the relationship you have with your friends. When you have conflict, a lot of times we have a hard time seeing things from their perspective. We only see it from our own perspective. So, for instance, how many times, even in good intentions, and I'll, I'll first talk about men here. I'll pick on men just for a second here. That the fact that we've told our wives, she gave us that honey-do list. She says, hey, you know, you got to get this stuff done. And you say, oh, absolutely, but we don't need to hire it out because I can, help me out, do it myself. Yes, there we go. We are still alive here. We got a pulse. Check your pulse. No, no, I can do it myself. I don't need to hire it out. I can do it myself. Six months later, one year later. It's still there. I don't need to hire anyone to take care of such and such. It could be a vehicle or it could be cleaning out my closet or it could be whatever because I can do it myself instead of asking for help or instead of hiring a professional. We do it out of love. We do it because we're trying to do the right thing. But in the end, we don't realize we're hurting our relationship because we, for whatever reason, have things that get in the way. I can flip the switch right here, and I don't have to uh, uh, single just men out here. How many times where even with, with, uh, with women, you maybe, maybe your husband purchased something at Christmas, and maybe it was going to be, maybe it was an air fryer, who knows all things, but because we get used to what we've done before, it sits in the box there. And we don't realize that every day that, that maybe we walk in the door and we see that that box sits there that almost is like a jab. I wanted to buy this to do something. Do we see things from the other person's perspective? Or do we only see things from our own perspective? Again, I'm gonna, I'll bring up one of high tension here and do not take this in the wrong way here, but this is one that I, I, I felt that I really needed to share just because again of how, uh, how important it is and let's just be real and honest here. Okay, I'll tell you right now that um, being that a lot of times when we do not look at things from the other person's perspective, and this is something Katrina and I have had to deal with, we've had, had the honest talk because again, I'm not in my pleather jeans, pants, you know, music things here with the little whatever, little guy dancing around stage here back 20 years ago. And you do, as you get older, you do tend to have your bodies go. Are we, both men and women, husband and wife, are we doing the best with no condemnation, but are we doing the best to look the best for our spouse? Are we doing our very best? I call it sweatpants syndrome. No, I'm joking. I made that up. Um, no, but seriously, we do. We tend to, as even Jimmy talked about last week, we never, ever want to be critical or offend our spouse's body, ever. But with that said, not pointing the finger at them, pointing the finger at yourself and say, am I doing everything I can so that I am pleasing? When they, when they look at me, they... They just love me, even if things are not as what they were however many years ago, 5, 10, 15 years ago. Am I doing everything I can? Am I presentable? 
Or basically, have I thrown in the towel and said, you know what? It all falls apart eventually. Here's what you got. You know, we don't want to go there. We don't want to go there. Yes. I know, yeah. Every, I, I know, yeah. We've had to have that talk. It's important. It's important to have that talk without condemning. Remember, not pointing the finger. You point at it yourselves. You encourage one another. You take the, the lead role. Men, take the lead role for yourself. Women, you take the lead role for yourselves and say, hey, we're going to work together. We're, I want to be the very best. We'll take a, just a moment before we end here, and we're going to talk about that. But we've had to work through these things. Let's, uh, let's jump in here real quick again. Uh, Song of Songs, uh, chapter 5, 4 through 6. This is, uh, again, a little bit about that uh, where she had already said, I had taken off my robe. I'm not getting up again. Now all of a sudden there's a changing of the mind. Because all of a sudden it says in, in verse 4 through 6, my beloved thrust his hand through the latch opening. And all of a sudden, oh, my heart starts to pound for him. She realizes, oh my gosh, I love him. And she said, I arose to open for my beloved, and my hand was dripped with myrrh. He was even being thoughtful, and he had put myrrh on the doorknob. My fingers were flowing with myrrh on the handles of the boat. Bolt. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had left. He was gone. He had waited, and now he's gone. My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but did not find him. I called for him, but he did not answer. She got up, but by the time she got up, he was gone. I'm not trying to bring some major deep uh, uh, theology out of this portion here, but this can go deep here. This even resembles our relationship with the Lord, where all of a sudden we wonder why something's not happened. And we, and we go there, oh, now all of a sudden there's something God had maybe an opportunity in our life and how we have to maybe seek and keep seeking his heart but in your relationship, sometimes we push off someone off, push someone off, push someone off. And we're going to watch here in, uh, in the next few verses here where, uh, or actually I'll paraphrase the next few verses here. Bottom line is she goes out and she seeks for him. She tries to find him. And in turn, the watchmen who were like false watchmen in the city, they ravaged her, ripped her cloak away, bruised her, beat her, humiliated her while she was looking for her lover. Because of the selfishness, because of, I don't want to go to the door there. Sometimes opportunities are missed. So here, real quick, how do we resolve conflict? We resolve conflict by, I will act and not react. I will act and not react. Romans 12, 21 says this, I'm just paraphrasing. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I'll tell you right here, this is not a, a this is pretty simple little statement I'm gonna make here. Work on not being so critical to your mate. Work on not being so critical to your spouse, your mate about every little thing. Are we acting or are we reacting? No one likes to be criticized. If you were at a job and every day you were being criticized, that you're no good, you know, your boss harassed you and just told you how, how no good you were, you wouldn't want to come back. But somehow when it comes in, in our relationships, in our marriages, we feel like it's okay to criticize and pick on the other person all the time. I think it has to do with the fact that probably dozens, if not hundreds of times, we have asked him to do something, her to do something, and they don't do it, and it brings eventual anger. The fact is, the Bible talks about this, and it talks about for men, it addresses men. It says, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. It talks about being considerate to them, treating with them with respect, and as heirs, as heirs of the gracious gift of life that we have in Christ. It talks about loving her and cherishing her, Submitting to one another as, you, as Christ laid down his life for you both. Talks to the women about honoring and respecting your husband. And understanding, submitting to him as he submits to Christ. Because Christ laid his life down for us all. 
Do not focus your time on trying to change your spouse. This is gonna be a big one. Focus on what you can do to change yourself. We are told in the Bible, we are told in the scripture to pray for one another. So we will do that. We should pray. If we have issues, we pray. We encourage. But many times when you talk to couples who have worked through some difficult marriages and they've come out the other side, they say, when I started to pray and and things started to change, the change wasn't so much in them. The change was in myself. Number two, I will focus on the good and not the bad. I will focus on the good and not the bad. Philippians 4, 8, again, whatever is true, noble, righteous, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We will focus on the good and not the bad. We stay in much better chance. We will have a much better chance in lifting each other's weaknesses, if we focus on our strengths. Katrina could have said to me early on in our relationship, this is not what I bargained for. I can't handle this stuff. Too much craziness, too much running around, not much hope here. You're you're running in a circle, not much gain, and I'm, I'm losing time. And she didn't. Maybe the person you're with right now, maybe the man you're with right now, maybe he's driven or maybe he's not driven, but maybe he's faithful. Maybe the lady you're with right now, maybe she's not the most amazing looking supermodel, but she's thoughtful. She's a good mom. Focus on the good. I will focus on the good and not the bad. We've heard many times in business the 80-20 principle. And the 80-20 principle is this. It's used in organizations, churches, you name it. It's always whether it's exactly to the point or not. The 80-20 principle is this. Like 80% of the people, or excuse me, well, 20% of the people do 80% of the work and vice versa. 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. We've heard this principle, okay? So here's something when it comes to relationships, marriages, that is so important here. And it's just, again, it's a, it's a rule. It's not going to be exactly 80%. It's that you're with the person you're with. You've been with the person you're with. Probably because of 80% of what they do right. And yet, how the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, bring someone into our life that offers the 20%. And what we end up falling for so many times is since we don't have the 20% need met, we find that in the other person and we leave behind the 80%. Again, what did she say? I'm not coming to the door. I'm not, I am tired. I am in bed for the night. And yet when she went and realized, man, I do love him. Now she's humiliated. Now she was running all over. She was hurt. She had forgotten. So what, how this speaks to all of you is yes, we don't leave someone else just because someone else out there is going to offer the little other 20%. But I would say to us individually, looking at ourselves, not at the other person, how can we close that gap? How can we close that gap and not have it be a 20% gap? If we're with someone that we love and we cherish and someone who we have been with, how do we close that gap? Maybe it's saying, I'm going to work on my health. Maybe it's going to, I'm going to work on my house. Maybe I'm going to be a better father, a better mother. I'm going to be more attentive to their needs. I'm not going to criticize. criticize. I'm going to focus on the good and not the bad. And last point here, I will talk and not walk. I will talk and not walk. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. What this verse means, and Katrina and I have done good at this, not great, but good at this. We try not to go to bed 
if we have unresolved conflict. We may not sleep for four days. No, uh, but uh, we try not to go to bed with unresolved conflict. We have not been the best in this area, but we have strived, strived to try to keep our harmonious relationship. I will talk and I will not walk. What that means is that we will chat things through. We will work it out. I'm not going to leave. I will not walk out on you. You're only setting yourself up if you allow anger to still inside your heart. Pray, focus on the good and not the bad. If you go on in uh, in chapter five, they meet up again and his eyes are all about her again. And then uh, then continuing on in chapter six, verse 11 here, we'll end with, He's like, I went down to the grove of nut trees to look at the new growth in the valley to see the vines had budded and the pomegranates were in bloom. Things were coming together. We had worked things out. I will talk. We will work through things. We will not walk. We will focus on the good and not the bad. I will act and not react. If we could uh, just bow our heads for a second here. Just gonna take a moment here and just, let's just, again, some of us, it's so easy to talk about these principles and yet it's so hard to actually walk through them. Father, right now, I just pray right now, as we are learning and growing to love you more, I pray for each person who is in a relationship today or even has relationships with other people, their children, their coworkers, their family that have had conflict and tension. I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would just, you would move on our behalf, realizing that we cannot necessarily change that we can change ourselves. You said you would never leave us nor forsake us. For those that have either been abandoned here today, someone has walked out on them. Just give an additional measure of comfort and grace. The Bible says no condemnation, those whom Christ Jesus. You are a good father. You are so good. You desire to know us. You desire to love us. Help us this in this month as we're learning about relationships that this love song would not just be for a man and a woman, but it would be for us toward you because that's your heart toward us. I pray that you make us people to forgive. Forgiveness is one of the most powerful things that we have. It can literally dismantle the plans of the enemy. Make us people to forgive, not always asking the other person. You gotta say sorry first, but we can just forgive. We can learn to be faithful. Father, right now, I just pray if anyone is either watching online right now or in this room and they have not started a relationship with you, pray that they would know how simple it is. You desire to know them. It's not awkward. It's not weird. You are the perfect father. You are the father that loves us unconditionally. We could have made a hundred screw-ups this week and you would just bring us right back in. If anyone is in this room and has never received Jesus, to walk down this relationship of knowing him as Lord of all, so you don't have to feel this void inside you of that I'm alone, I'm afraid, I have no one to turn to. You want a peace inside you that even you can go through amidst of a tough storm in your life and know he is there. I'm just gonna pray and you can just agree with this in your heart and then you can start this journey today, right now. 
Father God, I just thank you that you sent Jesus to bridge the gap from me not having what's good enough. But because he laid down his life, because he rose from the dead, he's given us life everlasting, life with freedom and liberty. I surrender my life to you, understanding that I don't have what it takes on my own. Guide me and teach me and show me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, see us, talk to us. This is much more than just, again, ushy gushy talk. This is about life lasting relationships, church. We want the Song of Songs to be a book that, man, you can just, you can read it and say, wow, God loves me and I can love my spouse better than I have. I can have an amazing relationship. We love you guys. Get to a life group this week, Wednesday night, our home, Friday night, Jimmy's home. Come on there. Yes, Tim, come on. No, no more cast on the boot for Tim there. Come on, we give it up to Tim there. Uh, again, we love you guys. There's probably much more goodies out there. Uh, hug someone, high five, fist pump if you're in the you know, end of the flu thing. You don't want to do the flu. Fist pump someone here, you know. Uh, uh, but again, get to know people here. We have a lot of loving people here. Thank you so much, everyone, all right?